Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Talking Channel. Today I have the pleasure of bringing you someone that I admire really, really a lot. Jan Peter Mainz, who is not only an incredible cellist, but he's also probably one of the most celebrated teachers of today. Hi Jan Peter, how are you? Hi, good to see you, how are you? I'm fine so far. It's great to see you. Listen, whenever I see you play, it looks like it's so easy for you. you, you I'm, I'm not, first of all, I'm a big fan of your playing, but you make it look like it just works out of, I don't know, out of magic. <laughs> well, thanks for the compliment for, uh, first. I, I guess, you know, uh, that we all have our strengths and, and weaknesses. And let's say that the easy, um, fast, elegant playing was uh, maybe clo more close to my nature. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I, I really had less difficulties with fast stuff than with, with slow stuff. That's that's for sure. And I, I, I had a great teacher, uh, and many great teachers, but uh, the one that I had when I was 10 to 16 years old, and of course, he really encouraged me to play the stuff like Frank Kerr and, and all the Dotsauer etudes and Papa etudes. But I remember one lesson when I was about 10 or 11, maybe, uh, then, then he just asked me, okay, now you play the swan, right now. And I was, <laughs> I was really struggling. I was always uh, like almost crying. So, you know, that was, that was, uh, I, that made me really think later. And maybe I, I, I worked on the other side. Uh, I tried to work on the other side, like the, the more, more heavy sound and, you know, fat, fat sound and, and also very slow stuff. And, uh, well, I don't know if I improve, but what I can say is that, uh, when I have to play something very slow, like, like one of my favorite pieces to play in concert actually now is, uh, is the Messiaen uh, Louange à uh, l'Eternité de Jesus from, from the quartet, you know, the famous, super super slow piece uh, and and i can say that I, I i feel good playing this now so maybe some little things improved <laughs> <laughs> for me for me it was the other way around i always felt more comfortable playing slower stuff than faster and i always had to make like a special effort on working fast stuff, trying to figure it out slowly um how would you how would you recommend someone to to work on their weaknesses? Because we all we all love to work in our strengths, of course, uh, but it's uh, probably even more important to work in our weaknesses. Yeah, well, of course, it depends on uh, on the situation on the player. But as far as I I'm concerned, uh, also in the teaching situations, sometimes I I really had the situations in master classes or lessons. That that uh, like a fundamental change of something very simple, yeah, like the position, you know, uh, the length of the end pin, the you know the, the position of the body towards the cello, something very simple. What you could really change in a second, really made a big difference also in sound in the hall, and um, I'm uh, like very impressed with uh, like some of those old schools. Uh, I think it's great that, that nowadays we can we have, we have something like YouTube and, and of course I don't encourage young cellists to spend too much time on a computer but uh, you know <laughs> you can find so many great things not only performances but but uh, you know I don't know if you know this this fantastic video of Leonard Rose Leonard Rose who was probably one of the most important cello teachers uh, in the US in, in the second half of uh, 20th century so he has this video on, on YouTube uh, it's called a, Ch a cello lesson with Leonard Rose, and he just sits on uh, the cello and explains like basic things, balancing, you know, using your arm weight, and that's uh, really, really helpful. Still, I mean, if I watch it now, I think everyone should, uh, uh, you know, really check that one out. And then, you know, of course, number one is the bow. That's that's very clear for sound production. 
and I, I have to say, yeah, I wanted to tell you <laughs> at this opportunity that I really, I like your videos too. You know, you, you are like a modern version of <laughs> modern version of Leonard Rose, because your videos show that um, no matter what level you are playing at, of course you're playing at the, at the highest level. That still, the, the work at the basics is, is really helpful. And and you know, you you had this one video when you were talking about the position of the thumb at the stick of the ball, and I was really impressed, and I tried it. And, you know, I almost always play like this now, because I think for, for someone with uh, some player like, like my nature, who is rather slim, okay, more or less, <laughs> slim, um, an elegant player, sometimes we really need to have a more direct transmission from like body weight, arm weight to the string. And when you put the thumb here, like the Russian school does, then this is really more direct and it helps me to feel you know uh, better in heavy stuff definitely at some point i um still keep my flexibility with this uh, like uh, I, I just was uh, working a lot on the bach suites uh, during corona time maybe as many other cellists too and uh, when i came to this movement um for instance no there were so many uh, fast spin crossings um, I went back to the old position. So I think flexibility is it, you know, for, for, for every kind of playing. <laughs> I, I, I even think that, uh, you know, we can have a baroque position, also in real, of course, sometimes, and we have a uh, more conventional, like uh, the thumb at the edge of the frog, and then yours, or Russian, and in the, in the extreme, uh, <laughs> No case when when we have to play uh, last page of Shostakovich concerto number one, we are so exhausted. <laughs> so that's evolution, <laughs> evolution of bow grip. So I mean anything is fine. It's really uh, maybe it wouldn't be so easy to play like this. <laughs> so, but I mean you know for Shostakovich last last page is absolutely fine, and and uh, this kind of flexibility is great. So um, you know the other side. Uh, the the dexterity of the left hand is something that maybe I look differently at now that I get a little bit older <laughs> because now I, I have to work on speed more than I had to, to do like 20 years ago so I, I, I really do the classic um, exercises like uh, and so on the Cosmon and I still I, I really love etudes I, I love them because uh, so many of them are great music pieces and uh, I think they're really worth uh, looking at not only from the technical point of view but also from the musical point of view um, so I try to keep uh, myself in, in, in shape with that well going back one a little bit you mentioned about um, the end pin how tall or how short um, this how much do you think that matters? Because I try not to think about it. I just sit somewhere, I think, kind of the same. But I know people who are completely obsessed with with that. Like they even measure it, to, so every day is the same. Um, and I know um, some people like to have like the chair in this particular dish, so the leg is like that. And then, in, do, 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 you, do you think about it at all? Or for you, is there any kind of proportion? Any advantages of a long? <laughs> that's that's a very good question. I think uh, one shouldn't get too nerdy about that. But uh, <laughs> as I said, there is um, there, there there is some effect when you change something. Let, let, let's let's look a little bit back on on history of cello playing. Then then we we see like Tortelier uh, inventing the the bent end pin very long and Rostopovich loved it obviously I mean we cannot say that Rostopovich had a small sound I mean he had a fantastic sound so he believed obviously in the cello being you know more like this more more high but also he used it I think to to almost lying on the cello so to produce that, that fantastic sound um, other schools are completely different like more conventional with a very small end pin uh, and they feel better you know, using using gravity uh, like this, so it's very individual. But it does change, and I think it helps experimenting uh, really. 
Um, also, I mean, if you if you want to go very nerdy, uh, the end pin itself, some some cellos really sound different. No, when, when you change the length, so because of some physical whatever. I mean, uh, and I have to say, I'm not too much a cello nerd in terms of also setup. Uh, but the only thing that I changed, like uh, within the late, within the, uh, the last twenty years, was was indeed the end pin material. I mean, the you know, because there are now so many uh, uh, like uh, great uh, new inventions that really help some cellos to to sound more free. And I remember that very shortly before I got my teaching job in Berlin, I, I someone uh, uh, like. Um, recommended me uh, a new end pin from Israel. It was from wood. It was a wooden end pin with a little metallic end pin. So I tried that and I, I remember that my audition for this um, was with that end pin and it sounded better than the one before and then came the carbon fiber and then came the Berlin end pin. I changed those things but of course it's, I mean better practice two hours more a day <laughs> than spending too much time. <laughs> I like it. But I mean, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, I would say like body position definitely changes. Uh, so um, maybe again, one, uh, one uh, idea about uh, like now, unfortunately, historic channel playing because Lynn Harrell passed, passed away, unfortunately. But he has also some very cool uh, videos there, out there. And there he explains his philosophy, uh, that uh, uh, meaning that it's not so good when you play too, you know, too much in the in the back, like lean back. So he 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 uh, suggests to have a rather short end pin and move it a little bit forward. So actually, you are, you know, maybe a little bit like Ostopovich, but in a different way. Uh, you know, lying on the cello more than uh, like hanging behind it. So you can really use your arm weight more efficiently. Um, that also helped some students or like also I tried it sometimes it feels really different you know also automatically your bow goes a little bit closer to the to the bridge which always helps the overtones I want to ask you about uh, your practice process uh, because I, I love how I'm very fascinated by by this by how other people practice um, is there anything that you focus in particular when you practice or do you go for like physical sensations? Do you go, I know it's very a very general question, but I just want to go understand what goes through your mind in general. Well, um, I do have a, a, like a routine when I have enough time <laughs> to, to start a good practicing day, but it's, it's not that special. I mean, uh, I, uh, as, I, as I said in the beginning, I mean, I, I, I focus, I should focus more on developing like deeper sound and more intense, uh, more more dense sound. So I, I uh, when I start, I, I set the metronome and, and try to play extremely slow, uh, extremely slow scales. Also uh, being inspired by some chamber music partners of mine that I'm very lucky uh, to know that have uh, like more Russian uh, school background and, and they told me and not, not only cellists but also violists and violinists uh, that, that they are, uh, back then when they studied they had this kind of competition who can play the longest note <laughs> I really I really I love that but uh, when uh, you have to really I don't know I think I already failed because they would be only here <laughs> after two, two seconds so <laughs> Really, like this. So I have a form of this. So my my first um, my first step would be like a like a scale in, in like a beat of sixty, and then six beats or something, you know, uh, like all four octaves. And then um, again, from another inspiration, uh, I, I witnessed Heinrich Schiff giving a master class to like excellent students, really excellent. But but anyway, the first thing they had to play was like a, the also in public uh, was a. To, you know, to uh, you know, show the flexibility here, which I also loved, and I, I, I do this. Um, then uh, the next is also a little bit like 
kind of bodybuilding for, for the sound is this, uh, I think coming from Rostopovich assisted, Gering has taught me this uh, scale to play with attacks. Like, it's very helpful to actually try to make it sound the same. Uh, and when I go back then, it's, uh, it's the other way around. So, up bow here, and down bow. So th this is um, something that, that makes me feel much better with the bow. Um, then my, my actually my, my number one exercise for, for warming up the left hand is uh, Für Jahr number 16. This, uh, and so on the whole page, also a little bit extended. Um, that came actually from, from uh, Arthur Noras, because I was uh, very, very impressed with, with him, with his playing. Back then, when he was in, in jury uh, of the Leonard Rose competition, the Leonard Rose again, in 93, so I think you, you were maybe just born <laughs> in that year, 93. <laughs> so um, so uh, that was the time when, the, when they started to have a competition, also a little bit like a cello festival. Uh, and and there was a, there were concerts for the jury members, and of course now I know how it feels to sit in a jury whole day, maybe for several days, and then to play a concert uh, in in front of a bunch of cellists. It's it's really hard. But then you know back then I thought, hmm, you guys, you have some difficulties. I mean, some, <laughs> some of them did, but of course I I really understand now. But 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 this man, Artur is like a rock, you know absolutely uh, you know, perfect, uh, just great cello playing. And someone told me that, that he, he does this exercise for you like up to this day, every morning uh, since 40 years. So um, I think I thought maybe I'd try the same. I mean, of course I don't play perfect still, but <laughs> no, you know, I think it really uh, helps to, to settle the position somehow. Oh yeah. I, I will try this exercise. Actually, I never, I never done it. Uh, many people recommend it. I, I will try. Um, you mentioned something about bow. You know, I, I think, I think you are a, an absolute master in bow control and, and particularly in, in bow distribution. Whenever I watch you play, I am like, it, it's like a master class of like how to make perfect bow distribution. And for me. I think bow, a good bow distribution has solved many, many of, of, of the problems I, I had and have. Um, how do you deal with this with your students? Uh, how, because I think it's a much more important issue that people tend to think. Yes, it's, it's extremely important. Well, first of all, um, I think of this Messiaen uh, piece again, uh, because when you, uh, you know, when you are forced to play to have uh, this kind of extremely slow ball speed, I think that's the first thing to, to, to be aware of, to have very, very different speeds, speeds of bow. So I, this is also one of the standard pieces that I, that I, that my students uh, learn for sure. Then, um, of course, the music uh, is should be, should always be the guide, you know. And uh, I found out, like uh, for instance, in a piece like like Schumann a Concerto, sometimes the the original slurs, uh, I wouldn't call them bowings, but slurs um, mm -hmm. are a little. They seem a little bit awkward, but he was a cellist. I mean, he played the cello a little bit, so I think he really knew. Um, and if you if you see something like in the uh, in the very beginning you have uh, and this next note is a single note. Of course, m uh, many cellists play. Uh, but if you once go into it and try to to really, then you have, you are forced somehow. To have a very uh, much faster uh, bow speed at this one uh, up bow, and it makes, I think it, it creates a special color, you know. And so, uh, for me, sometimes, sometimes, um, these kind of uh, like different bow speeds are really adding to the to the colorfulness of, of the face. So, 
so in, in like um, in, in many cases I, I encourage my students to, to, to really look at the original drawings and of course especially in a concerto we often have to change and maybe divide the bow more often but uh, I, mean, uh, I think it's worth uh, looking into that kind of details. Do you, do you also do original bowings in, for example, Haydn? On, uh, do, you, do you always um, look for the manuscript? Or... Well, um, yes. I mean, uh, of course, I'm, I'm, one, one shouldn't be an, 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 an urtext addict, of course, because uh, some urtexts, uh, if, you, if you play them uh, like, like they look, Especially in, in, in baroque music, and it's just uh, it's it's just wrong, yeah, you know. But in Haydn, uh, I find it very very interesting. Um, for instance, in, in in our beloved and most feared <laughs> D major uh, concerto, <laughs> then um, to see uh, the little differences. I mean, fortunately, we do have autograph uh, in this case, and we can see uh, the notations and uh, like. Um, I mean, little differences uh, between uh, the exposition and the recapitulation. So, uh, in, the, in, the re uh, in the exposition, in the recap, I mean, it sounds just, you know, those little things um, uh, are interesting. And um, if you look at, for example, uh, a sonata uh, by Anton Kraft, who, who was the cellist, who premiered uh, the, the second line the, uh, cello concerto? Um, there is a first edition, and it's the same thing. You know, when the when the same uh, like material comes again, in, in most cases it's, it's there are like very very different articulations, and so obviously that was the way to play. Um, so I, I suggest my my students that they have to be creative for that. I think any cellist should be created with that. When you see something where, it's, uh, where, where there's no uh, slurs at all, like... Um, of course, n normally what, uh, you know, the tradition says... Always the same, but... For instance, you know, just, you know, these kind of variations. Uh, you can be very creative uh, about actually. You can really um, create your own articulations according to the style, um, and it's this is um, something that is of course that's a very long uh, topic now. Like for instance, in comparison to Bach, in Bach uh, I have a little d uh, different opinion now uh, about variations in, 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 in slurs, but uh, in classical style I think there is a lot of uh, variation. Um, so, in classical stuff, there will be a bit maybe more freedom to to do the bow in some variations than in romantic. And and what in Bach? What 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 did you mean? What what, what did? In which way did you change your mind? Yes, um, actually, I changed my mind a um, couple couple of couple of years ago, and, and now recently again because uh, in the Corona time I, I was working on the suites uh, quite a lot. Um, and looking at the different editions, uh, and uh, um, I think I have a favorite um, edition for the Bach Suites, which is the Breitkopf uh, edition, because uh, I think it came out in the Bach year 2000. And, you know, they have a very good uh, way of explaining their articulations uh, in, the, in the critical report. And it's a, basically a very simple thing, because uh, we have uh, Anna Matarita's copy, of course, of the of, of the cello suites, but we don't have his, unfortunately. But we have her copy of the violin pieces, you know, uh, sonatas mm -hmm. and partitas, and and also the original. So we can there is a relation between the, the violin original and her copy, and we can very clearly see what kind of habits she had in copying it. So so many many slurs are a little bit smaller for her in her copy, and a little bit to the right. You know they move to say it in very simple, but they give some really good examples. So, in the end, uh, some of the bowings in, in the cello suites are mo most likely more more simple. Like uh, like one one example is um, 
Uh, mm. The prelude of number six, which uh, has, of course, um, the, the basic motif uh, that we all know, uh, which is clearly two against one. But like years ago, I, I also played many variations uh, and so on. But then I, I checked this this uh, this way of, of of reading the Magdalena in, in Breitkopf, and and because of the similarities in violin copy and cello copy, uh, they suggest uh, just a little bit similar to the same type of movement. Um, I, I very clearly remember that um, uh, I was discussing this with my assistant, Paolo Bonamini in, in, in Berlin. Um, who was a great Bach player, wonderful Bach player, and he played the prelude for me like this. And when I listened to it, it was so clear for me uh, that, that the structure of the piece, the form, um, is so much, so much uh, more clear, you know, because always when the motive comes back uh, in every key, uh, or G major. No, it always it's always very clearly noticeable, you know, and and uh, the the rest actually is, is sometimes um, actually more melodical, in a way. <laughs> Big melodies. So this is an example that actually the bowing can definitely change uh, the, the the character of a piece, or uh, let's say make the structure clearer. And more understandable, and therefore for me uh, definitely uh, more enjoyable, um, for sure. That that's an example. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I agree completely. Um, one of, one of the most difficult things. Well, Bach is incredibly difficult to play, I think in general. Um, but whenever I, I I practice it, I struggle a lot with clarity. You know, there is so many string crossings, and I, I, and I wonder why it is, because whenever I play something else, I'm not constantly thinking, oh, it's so dirty, so so many noises, but whenever I play Bach, I'm com uh, very disturbed about the amount, so I'm always trying to clean it. How, how do you work in clarity, in, in Bach in particular? Is there is there something I'm doing wrong that I didn't... I, I think... <laughs> that's, that's a great question. I think uh, we shouldn't be too much afraid of noises, actually, <laughs> because because the, the the sound ideal uh, of the time uh, obviously was very different. Uh, there's there's a very good example for this. Like if you compare uh, the fingering of uh, of Prelude of Number Two, uh, there's this famous fingering from Hugo Becker. Have you have you heard the name Hugo Becker? No, never. <laughs> I don't know his famous fingering. <laughs> I can show you. Uh, no, Hugo Becker was actually a, a, a German cello professor, actually at my school at the beginning of the of last century. So he was, he was, uh, he died in the thirties, but he was a quite famous professor. And uh, there is a um, there is a story about him in Piatigorsky's book because Piatigorsky played for him, and obviously the, the experience was very bad. <laughs> so I think <laughs> yeah, they they didn't get uh, along very well. So. There's, but I think there's too much of Hugo Becker bashing uh, because uh, I, I, I kind of like some aspects of his work. He wrote a very interesting book about cello playing. But too long story, I want to show you the, the fingering. The fingering, it goes, uh, he has this edition of, of the suites and it goes something like... Uh, and so on. <laughs> you know, that's... But that's of course that's that's romantic and you know sound idea. No, that's that's creating one line, one cantilena, you know, you know, huge sound, dark sound. And if you study, um, if you study very carefully uh, Bach Suite Number no. Five with Scottatura, which, well, shall I show it? No, maybe not, because otherwise. Yeah, yeah. as you want. Yeah, you know. Um, in, in in short words, when you when you play uh, number five with quadratura, quite consequently, and really play all the notes that are uh, notated where they are, then then you have uh, you have a kind of a, um, a, a key. Well, I, I think I will just. Like 
you have the the end of uh, they're like the end of the first part um, of course open string but then the chord Although it would be, would be very nice uh, to have the chord like this, but it's not written. It's uh, so that means this is he, he wants you know the, the trill uh, ending with the same color, and then the fugue op uh, opens up again with the same note but with an open string. And then you have not but. And so on. So that's very um, interesting. We have a, a, like a whole line of, of G's, the same note, but everyone is different. So, and in most cases, that's that means uh, open string, but not in all cases. So that means uh, with this, with this, like uh, kind of. Um, idea or, or you know scheme. And then I would I my interpretation of the beginning of of the second suite would definitely not be. Here. But <laughs> but uh, like the open string. Colors, but I would say many, many times more than usual open string, you know. But also uh, not open string when, when like a like a slurred figure is, is concerned. So, um, what I want to say, as it happened now for me, it was a bit noisy, you know. The A string was a bit, but I think it's fine. <laughs> you know, the A string is fine. Then the A string has a certain clarity or uh, not clarity but but brightness then a little bit more overtones maybe a little bit silvery but that adds actually to the to the colorfulness of the phrase and it's 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 not not meant to be uh, not, not meant to sound all the same while this is of course going yeah. for you know he wants to have this this like uninterrupted line which we want to have uh, hopefully in something like uh... yes yes there it's okay <laughs> yeah, oh, that's so interesting. And before, before we finish, I want to ask you about um, a problem I'm having and I want to ask for your help. I'm practicing the second concert of Sostakovich, which is the very, very first time I'm playing it. And I'm having troubles with a few things, but two in particular. In particular, one. one. Exactly, that one. <laughs> I, I don't know just how to find it. I mean, it just, I, I'm very afraid that that won't happen in the concert. And another thing that I am having problems is the. in the, in the third movement. I just don't know how to make it clear or, or should, does it need to be every single tot at the dawn? Or oh, more like at least, or well, <laughs> am I an expert on Shostakovich too? Maybe not. Well, I, my my only uh, my my um, uh, remembrances about this piece uh, are also dating very very much back. It was in another competition in, in Paolo a competition which uh, was programmed by Arthur Noras. Again, uh, talking about Arthur Noras, and, and the program was incredibly difficult. Uh, I remember the first round, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> no, this etude and, uh, and, 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 so, My God. you know, that was the first one, all for memory, and, and the, in the second round, um, Britain sonatas, uh, you know, and, and Beethoven, of course, and the, and the obligatory piece, like the huge repertoire, all from memory. And in the finals, there was a, there was a Haydn concerto, D major, and and a big 
you know, other concert concerto, but but not the too often played ones, not Shostakovich one, but Shostakovich two, and not Prokofiev concerto, <laughs> but Prokofiev cello concerto, which is even more difficult. Um, so we had, you know, we were really uh, looking like like uh, zombies. I think at the, uh, at the end of the competition. What a crazy program! That's the yeah, most insane it, program. It, yeah. it was really amazing, but. Um, I think it's uh, to answer your question. It's, it's really all mental, you know. Um, when I was preparing for the Haydn D major and the finals, I thought, okay, this is my music. I can really, uh, I can really uh, play, play play this really beautifully. But so I was not nervous. But then five minutes before I'm going on stage, <laughs> somehow I got afraid, and I think my Haydn was was not not very good actually. Uh, and and uh, with the Shostakovich, it was definitely the other way around. I was extremely nervous, and all the others also were who had to play it. Uh, I think I only slept three hours before the before the final round. Um, but then, on stage, somehow um, I was able to to calm down, and maybe what what helped me was was actually more musical thought, uh, which is, I think in this piece more important than the details. It's the coherence of the whole piece. I mean. Uh, Look at the metronome number. It's one. It's one metronome number for the whole piece, more or less. So of course, it has variations. That's that's for sure. Yes. But you know, uh, this this incredible arch you, you have to build. Um, really, if you if you if you hit that, um, if you get that, then I mean, this the tenth. I mean, who cares? It's it's really <laughs> you know you know uh, don't don't worry too much about it. And if you if you uh, I my idea would be. To, to be prepared for that uh, would be to practice Rostropovich cadenza of Haydn D major. There we are again, because you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> but then you you feel uh, that actually this cadenza has everything because you have to you know move you know the thirds, the octaves, and the tenths, which I will not demonstrate now. Um, but <laughs> but uh, you know then you have actually both that you need. You have um, probably much stability in the in the tenth. And also you have this kind of staccato feeling in the left hand, which you need for the digga digga dum, digga digga dum. Maybe that's an idea. Yeah, uh, true. All right, so I see a lot of eights and tenths in my near future now <laughs> practicing this. Practicing this. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Peter, for, for talking to me today. I, I love hearing you talk. So interesting. I hope, I hope you want... I hope you want to come back for another episode soon and I hope everyone liked it uh, at home. It's definitely an honor to be on this series. I mean, so many cello stars here. Uh, I feel very honored. That's all we have for you. Thank you very much, guys, for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode and happy practicing and thank you for watching.